tonight. Quake calamity. Taiwan suffers mass casualties following a magnitude 7.4 earthquake, one of the worst in the region in nearly 25 years. Rescue efforts struggle with locating survivors. Continuing conflict. Russia and Ukraine trade blows as the war wages on. Zelensky aims for one last push to increase manpower with lower enlistment ages. Struggle for democracy. India's opposition sees some hope with leader Sanjay Singh being granted bail. However, the government crackdown continues with more arrests. And big wheel bash. Adults and children alike tap into their inner daredevil on San Francisco streets equipped with the sickest rides. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for joining us here tonight on World News. We have a lot to get you updated on tonight from regional stories to the happenings in the US. But before any of that, we start with the sudden quakes in Taiwan. Taiwan has been struck by its most powerful earthquake in 25 years, which measured 7.4 in magnitude. Officials have confirmed that at least nine people have died, while rescuers are searching for dozens of people trapped in collapsed buildings. The epicenter is located about 18 kilometers south of Taiwan's Hualien City. A building in Hualien City, Taiwan, leans dangerously, looking as if it's about to fall. The death toll is rising in Taiwan with at least seven people confirmed dead and more than 700 injured, according to the government on Wednesday afternoon. Earlier in the day, Taiwan's weather officials announced a magnitude 7.2 earthquake hit the island at around 8 a.m. The authorities said the quake is the strongest to hit Taiwan in 25 years. At least 26 buildings have collapsed and more than 70 people are still waiting to be rescued. The quake caused damage to a major highway as well, with thousands of homes losing power in Hualien, a city of 350,000 residents on the east coast of Taiwan. Authorities said more than 25 aftershocks were registered. Aftershocks could still be felt in Taipei. The earthquake prompted other countries to issue tsunami warnings as well. Japan alerted people in Okinawa, some 700 kilometers away from Taiwan, to evacuate due to a possible tsunami, the first such warning in Okinawa since 2011. The warning was lifted around noon on Wednesday, with no damage reported due to tsunami waves. The Philippines also warned residents in the coastal areas of possible high tsunami waves. It also lifted its warning later on Wednesday. An update to yesterday's devastating strikes in Gaza. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has responded to an Israel Defense Forces airstrike that killed seven aid workers in Gaza, calling it devastating. Amid widespread condemnation from the international community, the Israeli Prime Minister called the attack a mistake. The United States, the UN and other world powers on Tuesday condemned an Israeli airstrike that mistakenly killed seven aid workers in Gaza. Video showed a large hole in the roof of a four-wheel drive vehicle belonging to the World Central Kitchen, a charity founded by celebrity chef Jose Andres. Paramedics were seen moving bodies into a hospital and displaying the passports of three of those killed. U.S. National Security Council Coordinator for Strategic Communications John Kirby said the White House was outraged by the attack. I think by, out, by saying we're outraged, I think you can fairly characterize that as condemning the strike itself? Of course. I mean, nobody wants to see this kind of violence happen to humanitarian aid workers who, as was noted earlier, were doing all the right things. The airstrike killed citizens of Australia, Britain and Poland, as well as Palestinians and a dual citizen of the United States and Canada. Israel's military expressed, quote, sincere sorrow over the incident. Here's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Unfortunately, in the last day, there was a tragic case of our forces unintentionally hitting innocent people in the Gaza Strip. This happens in wartime. We are thoroughly looking into it. 
are in contact with the government and will do everything to ensure it does not happen again. The incident ratcheted up international pressure for steps to ease the disastrous humanitarian situation in Gaza. Nearly six months into Israel's siege and invasion of the Palestinian enclave, including from UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. This is unconscionable, but it is an inevitable result of the way the war is being conducted. It demonstrates yet again the urgent need for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire, the unconditional release of all hostages, and the expansion of humanitarian aid into Gaza as the Security Council demanded in its resolution last week. The resolution must be implemented without delay. The Israeli military pledged an investigation into the deaths of the aid workers by an independent professional and expert body. We have updates on the Russia-Ukraine conflict now. Russia claimed to have repelled Ukrainian attacks in multiple fronts, while Ukraine stated on the same day that it had hit a number of military targets in Russia. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky signed into law a measure lowering the country's army mobilization age from 27 to 25. For more on this story, we have other than the World News Special Correspondent Minoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. Minoli? Yes, Anuradi. Its forces also hit base stations for electronic warfare, ammunition depots, drone factory and other objectives of the Ukrainian side. According to the ministry, Russian air defense forces shot down a number of Ukrainian drones in Belgorod and Kursk regions. The general staff of the Ukrainian armed forces released a battle report on the same day saying the Ukrainian army engaged dozens of battles with the Russian military on the front lines targeting Russian anti-aircraft missile system, anti-tank weapons, multiple rocket launchers and other objectives. In an evening video address, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky stated that the Russian forces attacked the Dnipropetrovsk region that day, resulting in 13 injuries. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than a World News special correspondent Manoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. Thanks again. We're in neighboring India now, where democracy and elections are taking center stage. India's Supreme Court has granted bail to an opposition MP and leader of Delhi's governing Aam Admi Party in a money laundering case. Leader Sanjay Singh was arrested in October in an investigation into the city's now scrapped policies over alcohol sales. Mr. Singh, who denies the corruption allegations, had challenged his arrest in court. The court observed that India's Financial Crimes Agency did not recover any legal funds from him. The court, however, dismissed a second plea by Mr. Singh accusing the Enforcement Directorate of arresting him illegally. Mr. Singh's release comes days after his colleague and Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal was arrested in the same case. The move sparked criticism from opposition parties that the government was stifling them ahead of the general elections, which are due in few weeks. Several AAP leaders have been accused of taking bribes in exchange of granting liquor license to selected businesses. Mr. Singh was the second AAP leader to be arrested after Delhi's former Deputy Chief Minister Mani Sisodia in February 2023. And now some diplomatic updates. An unlikely conversation, unexpected by most, has occurred. US President Joe Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping have talked on the phone for the first time since their summit last November. Biden underlined Washington's enduring commitment to the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Amid growing concerns over North Korea's continued missile and nuclear threats, U.S. President Joe Biden and his Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping held phone talks on Tuesday. According to the White House, Biden stressed Washington's enduring commitment to the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, adding that the talks between the two leaders were candid and constructive. The White House also said that Biden reiterated the U.S. stance of engaging in diplomacy with North Korea while taking further steps to deter further provocations by the regime. Tuesday's talks also came amid worries that Russia's veto of a UNSC resolution to extend the mandate of the expert panel overseeing the implementation of North Korean sanctions will lead to a potential erosion of the sanctions regime. The two leaders also discussed the ongoing issues regarding trade. 
Biden said the U.S. will prevent its advanced technology from being used to undermine America's national security, adding it will continue to limit China's access to key technology, such as advanced semiconductors, as part of its de-risking policy. The U.S. leader also raised issues over what the U.S. says is China's unfair trade policies and non-market economic practices. The Oval Office said that the two leaders also reviewed and encouraged the progress from their summit in San Francisco earlier this year, including anti-drug cooperation, ongoing military-to-military -military communication, talks to address AI-related risks, and continuing efforts on climate change. Biden and Xi welcomed ongoing efforts to maintain open channels of communication as U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen and Secretary of State Antony Blinken are set to visit China within the next few days. This will also be followed by talks between the defense chiefs of the two countries, as well as a visit by high-ranking Chinese officials to the U.S. in the near future. Going in for a short break now, we'll see you again with more stories from across the globe in just a moment. Stay tuned. Welcome back. We're back with yet more key regional updates now. Indonesia's president-elect Prabowo Subianto met Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida in Tokyo just yesterday. Prabowo's Tokyo trip followed his visit to Beijing to meet Chinese President Xi Jinping on Monday. The president-elect's first foreign tour less than two months after winning the race to succeed incumbent leader Joko Widodo. Prabowo, who currently serves as Indonesia's defense minister, also met his Japanese counterpart Mino in 2021, Prabowo and Indonesian Foreign Minister Rento Marsudi signed a deal to facilitate defense equipment transfers in a meeting with their Japanese counterparts, as Japan seeks to extend military and economic cooperation with Southeast Asian nations to counter China. And on the road to the White House tonight, both Joe Biden and Donald Trump won primary elections in four states, including the crucial battleground state of Wisconsin. Hundreds of delegates were up for grabs in Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York and Wisconsin, and Biden and Trump have already amassed enough delegates to win their respective nominations. But the turnout could provide more clues about the general election in November. For analysis, here is other there the World News Special Correspondent Suzanne Shanali from Toronto in Canada. Shanali, what's it looking like so far? Anuradi, it seems that we aren't seeing much of a change from previous predictions we discussed at the beginning of the race. And it's also interesting to note that in these prim uh, primaries, voters also had the chance to register their discontent with the nominees. Connecticut and Rhode Island gave voters the opportunity to vote uncommitted in the primary, while Wisconsin offered a similar option of uh, uninstructed delegation. Wisconsin Democrats will be closely watching the turnout for uninstructed delegation after progressive activists launched a campaign encouraging voters to withhold support from the U.S. president to protest his handling of the war in Gaza. The Listen to Wisconsin campaign, based on similar efforts in states like Michigan and Minnesota, has attracted support from some rank-file union members, as well as an influential group of low-wage and immigrant workers in the state. Those voters represent key constituencies who, su who support Biden will need to win in November, and even a small erosion in support could spell trouble for him in Wisconsin, where he defeated Trump by just zero. Point six points in 2020. In 2016, the former president defeated Hillary Clinton by roughly 0.8 points in Wisconsin, and he hopes to repeat that performance this fall. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than the World News special correspondent Suzanne Shanali from Toronto in Canada. We're still in the U.S. now. We have some weather woes in the country. 
Tens of millions of Americans are under a severe weather threat as risk zones extended from the Great Lakes to the Gulf Coast. Tornadoes were reported in several states. More torrential rain, high winds and heavy snow were in the forecast as the storm moves east. Tonight, drenching rains, high winds and tornadoes wreaking havoc. The dangerous trio sparking a state of emergency in Kentucky. Striking so fast, this student was knocked right off their feet. The massive storm ripping through this mobile home. A family trapped inside, but somehow able to escape unharmed. Severe weather blasting semi-trucks off the road. In Oklahoma, the same system responsible for multiple overnight tornadoes. In the town of Barnsdall, one reported twister sent debris everywhere. And it's blamed for ripping off roofs, including the one belonging to Sharon Horst. But fortunately, no injuries. In Illinois, an apparent tornado touching down. In Indiana, another close call. Gravel in my head. There's glass in my head. You know, whatever. And mud. There's still mud behind my ears. There's Kiana Duff heard the tornado warning seconds before the storm shattered every window in her car. Yet she walked away without even a scratch. And in Missouri, firefighters braving the elements to rescue a delivery driver trapped by rising waters. But back in Oklahoma, after a frightening night of tornadoes, the rush is on to move on. Senegal's once jailed opposition candidate, Basiro Diomaye Faye, was sworn in as the West African nation's fifth and youngest president ever, promising to restore stability and bring economic progress. Once a jailed opposition candidate, Basiro Diomaye Faye was sworn in on Tuesday as Senegal's fifth and youngest ever president. The 44-year-old former tax inspector defeated Amadou Ba, the candidate of outgoing President Macky Sall's ruling coalition, by a landslide in the first round of voting. The new president has vowed to tackle corruption and introduce a series of economic reforms to prioritize national interests, including the renegotiation of oil, gas and mineral contracts with foreign operators. Over a dozen heads of state and regional representatives attended the inauguration, including Nigeria's President Bola Tinubu, Ghana's President Nana Akufo-Addo and African Union Commission Chair Musa Faki Mohamed. The military juntas of Burkina Faso, Mali and Niger also sent representatives. The smooth transition is a welcome boost for the country. Three years of political turmoil in Senegal had raised concern about democratic backsliding in the Kupron region of West Africa, where juntas have seized power and cut ties with traditional Western allies in favor of Russia. Tesla has posted a decline in quarterly deliveries for the first time in nearly four years and missed Wall Street estimates, a performance some described as ugly as price cuts fail to stir demand in a highly competitive market. Shares of Tesla sank on Tuesday after the electric vehicle maker reported a drop in quarterly deliveries for the first time in nearly four years. The slump in deliveries, Tesla's closest approximation of sales, was described by some analysts as ugly, and it comes despite price cuts to drive up lagging demand. Elon Musk's EV maker said it delivered nearly 387,000 vehicles in the first three months of this year. That's an 8.5 percent drop from a year ago and a 20 percent drop from the previous quarter. One analyst called the results an unmitigated disaster that is hard to explain away, adding, quote, this was a train wreck into a brick wall quarter for Musk and company. Tesla attributed the drop in deliveries to its efforts to prepare its Fremont, California factory to handle increased production of the updated Model 3 and to shutdowns at its Berlin plant due to the impact of the Red Sea conflict and an arson attack. The company has also been facing intense competition in China from local players, including market leader BYD, which overtook Tesla as the largest EV maker in the fourth quarter. But there's another factor that could be denting Tesla's reputation, its CEO's often polarizing personality. A recent survey showed that Musk's tilt to right-wing politics and often controversial public statements are turning away some potential Tesla customers in the U.S. Still, with a market capitalization well above the combined valuation of Toyota, 
Mercedes-Benz, and Porsche, not all Wall Street analysts see a bumpy road ahead. Gene Munster of Deepwater Asset Management, among those who called Tesla's results ugly, nevertheless remained upbeat on the EV maker's long-term prospects. Writing on Musk's social media platform X, Munster said, quote, I still believe Tesla is on the right track and this storm will pass. Shares of Tesla were on track to lose about $30 billion in market value on Tuesday. That adds to a nearly 30 percent slide in value so far this year. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news right after this. Welcome back. We have quite an interesting story for you now. Dozens of daring adolescents and adults mounted up on children's plastic tricycles to ride down a famous curvy road to mark the return of the annual Bring Your Own Big Wheel event in San Francisco. For two whole hours, racers donned their finest costumes and pedaled to the metal as they took hair-raising turns down and around an approximately 700-foot section of Vermont Street in the Potero Hill neighborhood before hundreds of screens screaming spectators. The event is a free, all-ages, annual neighborhood event with the only rule being that the big wheels or tricycles are made of plastic with plastic wheels. To protect racers and spectators, parts of the street are lined with hay bales. Other parts of the streets are lined as they regularly are with either concrete sidings or plants and bushes for a softer crash landing. And finally, tonight we have updates on rapidly evolving technology that is artificial intelligence. OpenAI says it only needs 15 seconds of a human voice to replicate its sound and tone in an AI generated using the company's voice engine tool. While it's not the first synthetic voice generator, some, including OpenAI, express concern over the emerging technology that remains largely unregulated. OpenAI helped kickstart the new era of artificial intelligence with its text-generating tool ChatGPT. It stunned us with its AI-generated visuals through Dolly and amazed us with its text-to-video tool Sora. Now it's unveiling Voice Engine, a new text-to-audio generator that can turn this real human voice sample Force is a push or pull that can make an object move into this AI-generated one. Have you ever wondered why a soccer ball soars through the air OpenAI is saying it needs only a 15-second sample to generate a synthetic voice. OpenAI is not the first company to demonstrate the ability to clone voices. The risks of the technology already clear. Other voice-generating programs have already been used to create fake ransom messages, and even this fake robocall intended to sound like President Biden. It's important that you save your vote for the November election. OpenAI acknowledging the risks of this emerging technology, saying in its blog that it's working on the tool with a limited number of partners, and that, quote, we are taking a cautious and informed approach to a broader release due to the potential for synthetic voice misuse. But the company also demonstrating its potential, showing what it can do across languages. Friendship is a universal treasure. Here's that same phrase in Spanish. La amistad es un tesoro universal. Again in Japanese. Yujo wa hupentaki na takamono desu. And it's not just voices. OpenAI is also partnering with some filmmakers to try out its video generator, Sora, creating short movies like this one. I am literally filled with hot air. OpenAI demonstrating its capabilities in part to push society to prepare for technology that is no longer a matter of if, but when. But soon we won't just see images, sound and text. It could be an integral part of our daily lives much sooner than later. Well, that's all the stories we have to report to you tonight on World News. I'll see you again tomorrow with more updates from across the globe. Till then, good night.